we should go ahead and get started. So I'm going to pass it to Jacqueline to do the introductions. Okay, thank you, Erica. So welcome everyone. My name is Jacqueline Telgetter. I am a local mom in Darien and a certified parent coach. I'm really, really passionate about bringing enriching parenting content to our community. And I have the pleasure of introducing our fabulous guest tonight, Darby Fox. Uh, a few years ago, I recognized that one of my children was struggling with some pretty severe anxiety and a friend highly recommended Darby. When I called Darby, she was lovely from the get-go uh, and she said, I love anxiety. <laughs> and I could not believe she said that. I was so shocked. And she went on to explain how effective therapy can be for anxiety. And I could hear all of her passion and commitment in helping young people with their challenges. I was instantly taken by her authenticity and her pragmatism. She is someone I look up to professionally and personally. Darby is a mother of four thriving young adults, along with her flourishing private they practice. They tell me. <laughs> well, um, along with her flourishing private practice as a family and adolescent therapist, she also has written a book. It's about teenagers titled Rethinking Your Teenager, Shifting from Control and Conflict to Structure and Nurture to Raise Accountable Young Adults. I have read it word for word because it's actually very helpful for uh, children of any age. And I just so appreciate Darby's approach. She is able to illuminate the complexity of being a teenager and how we can as parents approach these years practically and with deep connection. And I really have been able to apply a lot of it to my children at younger ages. So I highly recommend it. Uh, tonight, Darby is going to be talking about how to set boundaries in a structured and nurtured way, particularly in our COVID world. Uh, she's going to remind us that saying yes or saying no is not connected to how much we love our children. And I think a lot of us parents can get uh, tied up in that. So this webinar is, um, it's, a, it's a format that the attendees can see the presenter, but the, the presenter cannot see or hear you. So um, we've left plenty of time for Q&A. And um, you can put your questions in the Q&A function or in the Zoom chat function. And Erica from the library, she's going to help you guys with that as we get into that section of the, of the lecture. So finally, before we get started, I would like to thank the Darien Library and the YWCA for their support of this event. It's thanks to organizations such as these that we live in really such a supportive community. Erica Walton, Walt, is here and um, she's from the library and she is their early literacy and outreach coordinator and will handle the Q&A like I said. So without further ado, let's turn it over to Darby. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I, I have to say I when I did first meet Jacqueline, I, I am always excited about anxiety because it's something I don't think we do a good job of teaching kids, adults, anyone how to to handle. And so my enthusiasm is it's actually something I can do something about. So um, I do want to touch on that tonight. And that's a great sort of jumping off point because I'd like to start there. And um, I think this first slide, I'm going to share the screen might startle you. So what I want to start with, and if you can read this, it's alarming to start with this, but I think it's really important because what I wanna do is tie it into why it's so important that we're able to set strong boundaries at an early age and then particularly in adolescence. Because what we have seen, and these have escalated a lot through the last 14 months, but if you start with this, 59% of all our youth have major, have, are untreated with any kind of depression, anxiety, anything like that, I want to encourage you that there is a way to prevent that. And one of the things that we haven't done well is really address the foundation of parenting and how we can prevent things like the escalation of mental health in not only our children, but particularly adolescents. So if you look at those, 
and you've all you're all familiar with it. We hear about how it's gotten so much worse through COVID. And and I want to spend a little time in giving you a like background and encouragement into why you want to build this strong foundation. And that's where the book ties in. So I don't want to really dwell on these, except these statistics are kind of startling. And that's why what I have to say, um, I want to encourage you to try and realize how important it is. So this is the first, this is the beginning. And this is true of actually any age. This is particularly an adolescent group. It starts with little kids, but there are two fundamental questions adolescents ask. And that is, am I loved? And can I have my own way? And any of you, even with young kids or early teens, the 12s, the 13s, that is something that you probably are very familiar with. Am I loved and can I have my own way? And what we want to do with these two questions is put it in a perspective. We have the next slide is a graph. And what we, the gold standard of parenting is, am I loved? Yes. Can I have my own way? Not always. In fact, as you get older, not a lot. And people are really scared by that, especially as parents or at uncertain times, we want to nurture them. And we think nurture and loving them means we're always going to coddle you and say yes or take care of your problems. And that leads to the escalation of mental health problems that I, to the numbers that I just showed you. So what I want to do is have you think about, look at this slide and be a little candid about where you might fall and how you answer these questions. So this quadrant, this as the answer is top right is where we want to be. This is considered gold standard. Am I loved? Yes. Can I have my own way? No. That's what we just learned. But if you look at this and you kind of find yourself on this spectrum, this is what tells us why boundary, whoops, you guys, I am so sorry. Um, I told my tech guy I didn't need him. Um, all right. So <laughs> if we come back to here, am I loved? No, not really. And can I have my own way? Not really. So this is highly authoritarian and somewhat dismissive. So you will raise kids that are distant. They could be the bullies. They could be quiet. They could be withdrawn. This part leaves a lot of room for personality and structure. Like what is it, how are they, is it manifested? So this here is not a great starting point. If you allow them to never have their own way and you're, you always want to control them, then you're going to get a kid that really struggles when they get out into a bigger world where they have to make their own decisions. If we come down to this next quadrant, which is low nurture and low structure, am I loved? Not really. And can I have my own way? Yes. That means I'm going out to dinner, do whatever you want. Like you might get in trouble later. I might yell at you later, but push comes to shove, I will always take care of things. I'll always fix things for you. If you look at this, I think you all know many people who do that. Those are the bullies where the people think you'll hear the parents or the moms at coffee. I can't believe this kid is so mean. And you're thinking in the background, oh my gosh, that's the kid that's bullying everyone, right? We all know these people, the bullies, they're dismissive. They don't really care about others. But that's because we as parents set up that structure. Am I loved? Not really. And of course, we all love our kids. So I want to clarify here. That means how is it manifested? Am I loved? Am I loved is yes, I can say no to you. And I will still be here for you. And unconditionally, I am here for you. That doesn't mean I'm always going to be able to solve things. I'm not always going to be there when you fall, but I will always be around to love you and take care of you in a um, 
What would the weight, what would a description in a nurturing way, but I can't solve all your problems. And that's a really important message that we haven't, we aren't very good at giving. And that's when we get to this next quadrant, which is high nurture, low structure. Again, most of you could think about people you know in this area. Am I loved? Yes. Can I have my own way? Yes. These are the kids that are very gifted and so talented. And anytime there's a test that's too much, then you call the school and you, you make an excuse for them. If they're running late, you make an excuse. Anything here you take care of. And it is because you love them, but it isn't helping them. It isn't helping them at all. If we think of what is our basic goal as parents, it's to raise kids that can then function as warm, empathetic, constructive adults. That's your goal as a parent. Your, your job as a parent isn't to just take care of this little person so they have the best looking resume. So this is a part where we'll get into the pieces of how do you do it. If we consider how the brain develops, and you look at a nine-year-old and how much here is still undeveloped, and we watch the incredible development as you go through the ages here, where it becomes more deeper, deeper purple, we know that that's an opportunity like no other except in, in utero that the brain is developing and really fast um, division of cells, pruning, all that stuff is happening. We know that our kids then have the ability through these years because we can see now with MRIs and scans, we didn't used to know this about the brain, we can see what's happening. So this is a critical time for you actually to be able to work with your children, your adolescents in particular, on this concept of saying, I love you to death and I am here for you unconditionally, but that does not mean I will always tell you yes. And, I, and when I tell you no, it isn't, doesn't mean I don't love you. It means that I am giving you guidance. Really important that we start to teach our kids um, that. And I have to say, I'll, I'll back up a little bit. It's critical, and we would have seen the results of this with COVID more than at any other time. During COVID, if what you were doing was really in that quadrant of a parent that's either very controlling and I'm going to, all you have to do is these things. I'll get you a tutor and you need to be a good athlete and you get good board scores and we'll get you into the best college. And then I know you'll be great. Or you were one of the parents like, okay, I'm going to take care of everything for you. Things fell apart pretty quickly when COVID came and it pushed us back to what am I going to do when everything's taken off the table? And that's why this is so critically important, not only to keep in mind the development, but what do we do through the developmental years? This is your opportunity, like no other, to work with your kids, to make connection, and to determine for them, model for them, how things will go as they go forward. What we want to do, and this is where we'll get into the stuff, that we basically have thought, and I've been guilty of this myself many times, I've raised four kids, is this linear thinking, what I just described. We're all thinking, okay, if I get them in the right school, if I'm in the right environment, we get the right tutors, the right sports, the right APs and test scores, then this is going to be Yale or Princeton or whatever it may be. What we just saw is when all that's taken off, if you were to erase the ABCD and come down to here where we just went through COVID, people panicked. People didn't know what to do because there was no line to follow. People have asked me time and time again, how do I parent through COVID? What I want to encourage them is if you were parenting from that top left quadrant, and I can go back to that. Look how good I've gotten. Okay. Um, if we go back to this quadrant, that's where I want you to remember you are. If you can raise your kids with high structure and high nurture, we know that when something rocks the boat, they have a very solid foundation. 
and they can endure anything. So that's what I want you to keep in mind. And I want to take down the slides now. So I know that was kind of quick and it seemed like there was a lot in there, but what I, but I want, what I want you to go back to is now think about if I were to be in that top quadrant, what is my fear? What am I afraid of in saying no to my child? Or what am I afraid of if I say yes? And when I went through COVID, so many people have said, I feel sorry, sorry for him. We did things we didn't normally do. There was extra screen time. Um, I let them stay up late at night. There were all these, I let them stay in bed to take their Zoom classes. All those things because we felt sorry for them. But what I want to tell you is that's super, that's not helpful. Because then they're always expecting someone to accommodate. And what we really want them to do is encourage them that even when you don't have control, you have the ability to reset and thrive. And so anybody who went through that, I, we all did, but if you were really permissive, I understand that, but I want to encourage you now to go back to a very structured um, format with your children. It, it's much more helpful. Um, what is your fear is basically what we always ask. And especially as you go into adolescence, it's, will my kids not be my friends if I say no? Will I get shut out? I won't communicate. I won't know what they're doing or who their friends are. So I'm going to say yes, because then they'll think I'm the cool parent and I'll be engaged. And what I want to encourage, again, it's critical to say no. I love you to death. And you know what? Dad and I just don't want you to go out. We, we don't believe in an endless curfew. We don't think a lot good happens late at night. Or I understand you're tired, but you still have to get up and go to your sister's soccer game. Because what we want to do is remember that what we're modeling is we're modeling how it is as you get older. The more that they get used to that and understand that it's not about you not loving them, then they can deal with it. It's like, you know, I love you to death, but you did something wrong. So let's deal with this and move forward. So I think that that's a really important stance for people to understand and the difference between loving and saying yes or no. Those boundaries never help. No adult gets to do whatever they want with bosses or teachers or in an intimate relationship. So the key part of adolescence is if you keep in mind that you're trying to raise your adolescence, this is their practicing stage. So they'll be able to negotiate these pieces as they get older. I think it's an easier mindset to be able to say, okay, what happens if I don't say no now? They're not going to know how to handle it later on. So that's a really important um, mindset to keep that connection going. And what I, what I want you to think about in that is where is your behavior? So I want you to model the same behavior. Like when you hear someone say no to you or the airline agent says the flight closed and you can't get on, if you freak out and you try and, you know, pull rewards and all those kind of things, you're actually modeling the behavior that we just said isn't very helpful. It's like, there should be an advantage. I should get this advantage. So we wanna be really careful about drinking and driving for your adolescents. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've had people say, oh, my parents say don't drink and drive, but I've seen them do it. All those things, or I'm not supposed to talk badly about that person, but I heard my mom on the phone the other day. I want you to keep in mind those pieces. One of the most important things you do as a parent is not what you say. It's what you do. And they watch everything. And I think that that's um, one of the main things. We, we kind of know that when they're little, but we forget it when they're older. I would I think that they are much more mindful as they get older. Um, another thing is I really want you to allow them to fail. And adolescence is when you allow them to fail, whether it's sixth grade, fourth grade, seventh grade, ninth grade, you have to let them when they don't do well on a test, go talk to the teacher and figure out how to change it. 
you don't make that call for yourself. If it's the sports team, you encourage them to talk to the coach and see what they can do better. It isn't about the parent calling the coach and saying, my kid is going to be amazing. This is what you better do. Because what happens is we're building this false sense of security. And once those, those mental illness figures escalate because there's no foundation. And we push that by not holding them to really strong standards and boundaries. And so I think people would sort of say, you know, that sounds really good, but how do I do that? One of the first things is communication. How do I do communication? And it's pretty hard in adolescence because we all know their attitude changes. They are hardwired to want social activity. So most of our teens don't really talk to us. Communication isn't about asking questions. Communication is about understanding where they might be. And then also you imparting on them where you might be. Like, I really get that you want to be out with all your friends, but you know what? We just don't agree with that. I, I am not going to let my ninth grader have alcohol. I just, I'm not on board with that. It's several years before it's legal. Those kind of things, if you can hold them and you acknowledge to your child, I understand what you want or where you are, but I'm in a different place for this reason. That's communication. Communication isn't just about how was your day at school? Most any kid's going to just look at you like, what? I don't want to answer that question, right? So I, I want people to think about that first piece. How do I connect with my adolescent? The way to help them is acknowledge that you know where they are and then communicate. Even though you know where they are, there are still standards you expect them to meet. And that isn't always yes. It's not always permission. Um, and, and along with that is help them set goals and focus. That really helps us when things go wrong or you get cut from a team or you're not invited to a party or you see a Snapchat and you know there's something happening that you're not included. Really important if you can pull back and your goal isn't to teach your kids just to be happy because happiness is pretty fleeting. What we wanna teach them is you're gonna be happy a lot of the times, but you're not always happy. And what do you do when you're not there? You refocus, you reframe. Really important. I mean, I would start that with little kids. Like, okay, they took your toy. So what can you do? Get another toy. We want to keep teaching them. When you don't get what you want, you reframe it. That's two really important things. That's about choice. And that's about control. And those are the two pieces that allow us to set strong boundaries. If I can't control it, where is my choice? What can I do about it? Really important thing. So if you don't take away anything else tonight, those are the key pieces of raising an adolescent. They aren't going to listen to me controlling them. How can I communicate and connect with them? And you have to go a completely different route than saying just no, because I don't like it or I don't want you to. You have to make a connection. And if you think about that, that's pretty much with any relationship. For some reason, we think with teenagers, it will be different. But with teenagers, it's more important than anything else you do. Pretty much anything else you do. Um, and to be effective, effective at that, you have to also say to your kids when you screwed up. Like, they will quickly come back to you and they'll sort of say, you were wrong. You have to be old enough, big enough to say, yeah, I was wrong. I made a mistake. Never raised a 14-year-old before. Never had a 15-year-old. I was wrong. This was my reasoning. We'll do it differently. Again, that's that modeling piece. That's that piece that tells you to your kids, I hear you, I see you, and I don't always have to agree with you, and I still love you. I'm still right here. And that's a really... Um, it sounds foreign to most people and they're like, oh no, that won't work. It works. If you don't have a connection with your adolescent, then you're not gonna be able to, to have any kind of say over where they go or what they do. 
and your adolescent years will be really conflictual. So I think that that is um, one of the most important pieces of raising adolescents and this control piece that's different than what you'll hear most places. The concept of control um, for parents is very logical because you usually fear because you knew what you did, but there's no connection with your child, your adolescent, because they're hardwired to try new things and to seek gratification. So if you think about that, then you know that just you saying, no, you can't do it is not enough. You have to take that next step to make the connection. And that is, um, I don't wanna go, I, I have some great questions here that are so important that connect with that. And then maybe there's a few more. So I wanna stop with the kind of luxury piece there and um, answer your questions so that it's kind of an example of what I was talking about. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. So um, Erica, maybe I should start with the ones that you sent me earlier. Is that? Yeah, okay. that sounds good. Do you have them there or do you want I me to? I do, I do. Okay. But, but would you, if you've got them, you could read them because no okay. one else will, okay. Yeah, all right. The first one is how much freedom should we give to our 13 year old? Should we enforce family time or only when she wants to join? Okay, you give her with that, the communication. So you give her some freedom, but not total freedom. Because again, total freedom isn't the way life is. And it's certainly less and less as you get older, right? You got a lot of freedom when you're two, by and large. But when you're 13 or 18 or 26, there's not that much freedom. So we don't want to set up that notion that they always get their choice of what to do. So with family time, so you don't get total resistance and shut out. You say to them, it's super important to us. What would you be willing to do? The minute that you ask them where they are in it, then you also get to set your standards. Okay, it's important for your dad and I that you give us some time what would you like to do? Do you want to go to your sister's sporting games and get lunch afterwards? Or would you rather do family dinner on Sunday? I need your buy-in for some of this. And I'm going to stick with that. Most kids, if you ask them, will give you some sort of guidance and, and, you, and you set the parameter. You get some choice, but not complete choice. So I think that answers that. All right, the next one is how, um, how do you control how much um, their daughter or your daughter spends and not resent the constant asking? So that's a, that's a tricky question and a, and a good question about money because that definitely goes into the, do I always say yes and then regret it? Um, don't always say yes. Set a standard and every family is different and it's what works best in your family whether you have allowance and then you kind of stick with that and you let your kids know, what does this cover? We're gonna give you so much a week and we expect you to get your candy or your movie ticket, whatever, that's one way to do it. Or is it bigger? We're gonna give you some allowance and we expect you to do certain chores in exchange for money and then you build up your money and you can get the new skateboard or you can contribute towards a bike, whatever that may be. The other piece is if you just have no, if you don't have any set schedule for how you, they get money, that's okay, but then you can't resent it because they don't have anything to look at. They have no guideline. How do we know how to, I mean, literally, I still think I have kids that think the ATM is just like, you know, you just go there and you get money, right? Like, isn't that how it works? So I think, and my kids are old. So I think it's important that you set that standard. Like if I'm willing to always give them more money, I can't resent them. So what I'm going to do so I don't resent them is I'm going to give them a set amount of money. And again, there comes the no. Honey, you don't have enough money for that. So make a choice. That's not punitive. It's actually really helpful because whenever you tell a kid, 
make a choice, you're actually empowering them. You're giving them accountability and you're allowing them to decide where they have agency. Where am I in this? Am I going to spend it all now on my skateboard or am I going to kind of save it and see what else is important to me? If you give your child that choice, it, it, in every family, you'll have a saver and you'll have a spender. Whatever it is, you want to build on that, but you want it to be about them understanding you have a choice here. You get to do it your way, but I'm not going to be resentful. And if you're a parent that just keeps giving money, you don't have the right to be resentful because you haven't set up a boundary. All right, the next one question is actually also very similar to the question that someone popped into the Q&A section, which is um, what are some ways to manage keeping your child accountable when their friends are not held to the same standards? And the question in the chat was, how do you handle when parents of family or friends have different beliefs about raising adolescents and how to find a balance? I think they're similar questions. Yeah, they're very similar questions. They're great questions. Um, and uh, I, I think the best answer there is, I don't wanna ever presume that the way I did it is how everybody should do it. Every family should have a set of, sort of a, a set of values in a way that they would like to do it. And when your family comes up against other families that don't have that same value, I want you to acknowledge the difference, but still stick with what's important to you. And if I can use an example, Jacqueline is very good at being able to say, these are our family values and I love you to death. And I'm sorry that we're not giving you a phone, a six, $700 phone when you're in fifth grade. Like it has nothing to do with how much we love you. It's just our rule. And I think that that's really important. And the more that we can do that and encourage, I really encourage parents to stick to structure and what works for your family. And what you simply say is, I, I'm, you know, two pieces as I answer that. Most of the time they tell you everybody else doesn't have the same rules. That's not true. It's almost never true. But what you say is, that's fine. They're, they're not our family. I only have to worry about my family. And these are our rules. And I'm sorry if they seem kind of strict or kind of hard. We love you to death, but we're sticking with it. That's really important to do. This is what we value. Again, that comes back to the communication piece. That's like, communicate where you don't, you know, I'm not going to go with the five other people down the street. I, I like them. They're nice. They have great families, whatever. But what we're doing is right here in our home. Really important that you encourage them that you're going to stick with it because it always gives them the ability to know they can stick with a, a no that they can set a boundary. And that's really important um, as we go forward. Have rules, have structure. It actually builds in a lot for your kids through adolescence. My mom says I have to come home or I can't do that. Really helpful for most people. Thanks. All right, the last one that was um, submitted previously was how do you navigate a power struggle between child and the other parent? Okay, that's a complicated one. <laughs> um, with parents, it is probably best if you can agree together on how you're going to do that. But within most um, couples, there is one that's a little easier to get away with things with and someone who's a little stricter. It's just kind of human nature and how it goes. So again, you want to be in line with the other parent, with the other adult, that you guys are on the same way. And you preempt that like by being very um, transparent. I know that your mom will say yes, but I want you to listen to why I say no. 
And we're going to stick with this. And I need you to, if it's a little kid, you, you, you stick with them and you say, look, we aren't going to do this because this could be harmful or you need to go to bed because you need your sleep at night. And I know it's hard when you go to your mom and she doesn't really follow these same rules, but I really need you to get sleep. Whatever that piece is, the parents then have to have the same buy-in. A kid is very smart. They observe everything and they know exactly what they can do. So you're gonna have a constant battle. And as you hit adolescence, things will go like this. They'll go completely off the wall if you don't get that piece of coming together at the same time. And again, as with any communication or relationship, the two parents have to decide, okay, what's my end? I'll, I'll give a little here, but what's my end? I'm not going to just let them do anything or I won't let them have a, they have to have a curfew. Whatever that piece is, you have to be on, on the same page. Thanks. That's great. Um, does anybody have any other questions? Those were all great questions. Um, I'm trying to think of something. <laughs> okay, I have I have one that I can um, talk about that I I'll just hit a couple quickly about um, things that I see often. So again, the bribery. If we're trying to get kids to buy in, young or old, we're trying to get them to hit a certain benchmark, um, certain grades, or um, sleep, or a certain, you know, sometimes we need to really encourage kids to get physical activity, whatever that is. Um, the idea is, yes, bribery is okay. If it, if you need to start with that, it's okay because it gets them to a certain place that they know they can do it. And we all have a hard time with that, but then we have to be really clear. That's where the hard boundary comes in to say, okay, I know you can do it. And we don't have to keep bringing up the bribery, but we're like, we're not going to give you stuff each time because we believe in you. We know you have the ability to do this. And we're very proud of your effort. Praise their effort. We're very excited. You can achieve this, but we don't need to give you gifts. We need you to motivate because you're so strong and you have that ability and we're so excited you did it. So that's a really important piece there. Yeah, sometimes we always need to bribe to get them to go there, but then we reassure their effort and what they did. And that's actually, if you think about it, what everybody wants to hear. Everybody wants to have a compliment. You want someone to say you did a great job and that's what's really important. Uh -huh. Thanks. We have another question. She says, um, I have an eight-year-old boy. I feel that a lot of his frustration comes from anxiety. When he doesn't get his way or something doesn't go as planned, he gets mad. What is the best way to deal with tantrums? So with tantrums, there are basically two kinds of tantrums. There's the tantrum where they really know what they're doing and they want to get their own way and they go to it because it works. Um, usually it's pretty repeated or it's in a kind of weird public setting and you're like, okay, I'll, I'll give you that. Just put it in the shopping cart and let's get out of here. Or the other kind of tantrum is really when they're at the end of their day, they probably are overtired, overstimulated, and they're just at the end of their rope and they really can't control themselves. They're really um, overstimulated and underregulated. So whichever kind that is, what you really want to do is not isolate him and, you know, put him in his room or put him in timeout. And by the same token, you don't want to go to the other end of the spectrum, which is again, um, just, you know, punishing him. So if we go back to that original quadrant, and I do it if I could quickly, but I can't. So anyway, if you go back to that original quadrant, that is a great question of, do I let him have his own control? I love him and he can do whatever he wants. It's going to continue. And as he gets older, it's going to be worse. 
And then the other piece is, I am so mad he did that. It's embarrassing. I'm going to punish him. I'm put him in his room. Neither one of those will work. What you want to do is engage him. With any tantrum, you want to acknowledge, I see you're struggling. And I'm not going to go anywhere, but you need to calm down. I'm not necessarily going to give in, but I can see things are difficult for you right now. As soon as, if it's at eight, it's like, calm down. As soon as you can control yourself, we can figure out what's wrong or we can figure out a solution. Again, you're modeling what can be done. If you just separate them, it's kind of mad and shame. At eight, you're right at the cusp. You want to get this under control because at eight, they can kind of get away with tantrums, but at 10 or 14, no one wants a tantrum. And so it also doesn't feel good and it's kind of embarrassing. So what you want to do when you notice the dysregulation is acknowledge it by saying, I can see you're struggling. What's happening? How can I help you? I'm not going to tolerate the tantrum or I'm sorry you're mad. It didn't go your way. But you know what? Let's take a minute. Let's figure out what we can do. So it's that reframe, redirect, but very clear. It's not okay to explode like that, but we can figure it out. Thanks. All right, we have two more questions. Okay. One is, do I need to be worried if my 14-year-old is not demanding at all? I don't know that you have to be worried. I would want to know more about all the other pieces. Like, are they someone that's always, um, you know, with their friends? Do they always, you know, take the back seat? If they're not demanding at all, I would only worry if it seems to that something else is out of place. Everybody's not super demanding and some, some kids just don't need that. So I would actually, if, if, if you, if you want to unmute yourself and ask, give me a little more information, I can be more complete with that. That one was asked anonymously. Okay. Then I, I think it's not a problem if your child seems happy. It is a problem if they never go out, they don't seem to have friends, if there's a drop in school grades, if they're just not participating at all and it's really withdrawn behavior, almost like a lethargic sad thing, then you wanna kind of explore that a little more. And again, give them the boundaries of what you kind of would like to see them do and ask how you can help them that, with that. But a lot of kids just aren't that demanding. She added a comment of, she said she's balanced but introverted. So. Yeah, so we don't, I, I spoke to a kid about that today. We don't have a great world for introverts. And an introvert means when you need to go and recharge, what do you do? Do you want to go to a big party, a group, a dinner? It doesn't mean you have low self-esteem or you can't handle things or you're shy. It just means if you're an introvert, when you need to recharge, you don't want to be in a big group and you, you kind of want to withdraw and do your own thing. That's totally acceptable. And it, and it should be. And usually introverts can express that. Thanks. All right. The next question is, can you address how to manage teen siblings who are always at one another? Yeah, that's, that's always hard. Um, Cause they usually have pretty different personalities. So what I would do again is in the moment when they're at each other, I'd kind of stop them. And I'd say, wait a second, guys, like this is not pleasant for anyone. Stop. And when they, and I would sort of separate them. And usually there's one that's a little bit smarter or school's a little easier for, or one's a little bit better musician or a little bit better athlete. There's usually some discrepancy there that both kids, or if it's three kids, everybody's a little um, protective and self-defensive about what they're not as strong at. So what you wanna do with the siblings is be like, you know what, that's not as easy for your sister. Like, this is easy for you, 
but school's not so easy for her. Could you just give her a break? What would it feel like to be in your sister's shoes? Or maybe the brother has jerky friends. You're like, you know what? His friends always leave him out. Could you just not rip into him? Could you just not? All it it will, it takes a couple of times. It doesn't happen overnight. But that piece of connection and reflection is really important because everybody can respond to that. So being really punitive won't help. And um just ignoring it, just yelling at them to stop never helps. Um, but that reflective moment, like, can you connect to, to that piece? Usually it's something you tease them about. So can you connect to that? Like, I know you, I know that's not your issue, but what would it be like? And you know what, by the way, you struggle here and they don't. So we want to bring up that reflective and empathetic lens. All right, that is it for questions, unless anybody has one more extra burning questions that they have for their children or if they are adolescents or they're about to hit that stage. Any, any age. Yeah, any age. <laughs> Wait, we have another one. Uh, all right. Oh, my eighth grade daughter's close friend is dating. My husband and I are trying to hold our daughter off dating. What's your advice, especially for middle school parents? Um, that's a great question. So again, it's okay for you to say your dad and I really aren't super comfortable with that and ex explain the reasons. Um, with the middle school dating, frequently they kind of fall to one way or the other. They're either like they say they're dating someone and they barely speak to them or they can be pretty progressive. And it definitely happens in middle school. And I think you, what you want to reflect is, I don't think you're mature enough at this age to understand an intimate relationship. And your dad and I don't think it's a great idea at this stage. You don't want to be really punitive about it. You can talk, to, would you like to have them over? That usually is a great question because they'll quickly be like, no, I wouldn't do that. Or I don't want them around you. Then it's not a real genuine interest. And you want to be really clear about how you build intimacy or a relationship. And it isn't something that just happens. They're not, they shouldn't be bringing it home to you unless there's a real um, sort of connection or desire. It's pretty fleeting in the moment. And as you ask that, we do see something with sexuality and sexual identity that we never, ever saw before. And as much as it can be really shocking, um, our kids, young kids have been kind of thrown into that 13 year olds, 12 year olds, and they, they, they think they have to declare something about their sexuality. I encourage you to not be really reactive. I encourage you to be like, okay, what, like just, Encourage them to take some time and just enjoy their friends that they're with, not go to that sexual piece because they're really too young. They don't really know what it means. And it's kind of a cultural, it's like, what's my identity? We really want to hold them back. We want them to figure out what their identity is before they claim it, as opposed to claiming something that they don't know anything about. Does that make sense? And then actually kind of um, the next question is, are you seeing an increase in teens coming out regarding their sexual orientation more so in the past two or three years? Yes. So that, that's why I speak to that. And um, again, I want to reiterate, I think in the book, one term we used is... Um, what I, what I encourage parents and kids to do is come into their sexuality as, as opposed to saying I'm coming out because we do see the numbers, the research really show us it's a very fluid changing um, number through anywhere from a homosexual to heterosexual to any, any kind of sexual identity goes clear across the spectrum from 
through the adolescent ages up somewhere into the early mid 20s. So with that, what we want to encourage people to do and young kids particularly is, you know what, figure out how to have relationships, figure out what it takes to be close to someone. What are the boundaries? What are things you say or don't say? Do I use Snapchat? Do I post a bad picture? What is, how do I figure out this relationship piece as opposed to come out and say, this is what my sexual identity is. Often when we see that in the young ages, those children or, or young adolescents, I should say, to be respectful, haven't had sex. They haven't had any sexual experience. So it doesn't mean they don't know, but it means it's a kind of fluid developing thing. So we want them to be a little more um, withholding for their own identity because it allows less confusion and allows them to develop a more authentic self than claiming a label, if, if that makes sense. Yep, that's great. Um, all right, we are almost done. If anyone has, <laughs> you can do one more question if somebody, <laughs> I feel like they kind of trickle in as people are yeah. thinking about them. Um, and I wanna encourage if anybody time. has something, um, you certainly, you know, my email or there's social media, there's a lot of ways you could connect with me if there's something that seems, um, you know, you don't want to put it up there or it comes to you later. I, I love answering the questions and it's always easier when I have a specific example. I saw one in the chat that somehow disappeared and it was... Um, I saw something about girls being rude. Yes, girls uh, speaking rudely, especially to their parents um, or their mother uh, in a really disrespectful tone. Yep, like they're almost like they're an equal to the parent. How would you handle that? Okay, that's a, an amazing question because it mm -hmm. happens all the time. So um, there's no, there shouldn't be any tolerance for rudeness. Um, you, you really want to make sure that you hold them accountable to, and it isn't just about the fact that you're older, while that is very important, manners are essential, because again, that's kind of how our world works. Like you want to teach them that people aren't going to respond to you unless you can respond appropriately to them. So as a parent, as a mother, when they talk to you that way, just you don't have to get mad and yell back or anything like that. You're just like, you know what? You really got to try a different way. I, I don't work for you. Like that's not how you treat people. So again, you're modeling to them what needs to be done. And you, there should be zero tolerance for that rudeness. And what I often see is parents say, and I have this question all the time, he is so rude to me, but then, and I'm like, okay, but then you still made him breakfast and you carried it to the car. Like you still did everything for them and they were really rude to you. So what I want you to think about is withdrawing your attention and you're like, I can't drive you to school, especially if you're late, when you treat me like that. I'm not mad at you. I still love you, but get it together. You don't get to talk to me that way really important that you set that strong standard up front. And even, you know, say, wait a sec, could you try a different tone? Lots of times you can use sense of humor, like, oh, okay. And it really, you, you have to stop it in its tracks. Thanks. That is fantastic. Um, all right. So I think that is all of our questions. I just wanted to say thank you again to Darby. This has been amazing um, and really informative. Um, and also thank you to Jacqueline for helping set this thank up. You. That was- Oh, wonderful. I loved it. Thank you, Darby. Thank you, Erica. Thank you to the YW. This is wonderful. And yes, then thank you for having me and all, all of you for joining, but thank you guys for sponsoring. I think it's important that people have a place they can ask the questions. Yeah, it's great. So thank you and have a great evening. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye. Good night.